see. Okay, it should be going live just any, it says I'm live. So it says I'm setting up my Facebook webinar is now streaming live. I think we can go for it. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining me today on Tracy TV. Whether you're listening to this live or later, I am so honored and grateful that my friend Carrie has agreed to get on to um, Tracy TV with me today. She's a dear friend. We won't even count how many years we've been friends, but I know I didn't have children when we were when we first met. I think I was just starting to have them. So we've we've gone back. And, um, and I'll tell you, one of the things I love about social media is I'm sure Carrie and I would have lost each other had we not had this platform to stay friends. And, um, and she has been such an inspiration to me. I'm probably going to cry while we do this, <laughs> Carrie. She's been such an inspiration to me over the years in so many ways. She's incredibly smart and talented as an individual. Um, and she had a beautiful daughter named Amalia. Amalia, right? I'm pronouncing that correctly. And um, I'm going to let her tell you the story, um, but um, Carrie and her husband, Frank, lost Amalia um, a, a couple of months ago, not long at all. And I I watched her journey and it was powerful. And um, she continued to find joy in the moments that she she had them. And, um, and it's continued to just uh, be remarkable to me. And I think her story is going to resonate with all of you for anyone who is taking care of somebody else who really needs them and might feel like they're losing their own uh, self-care and identity in the process. And so I love her story. So Carrie, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and just start by telling us as much as you want about the story and the journey. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Tracy, um, for inviting me and um, for saying such kind words, uh, such a, such a, such a nice introduction and uh, a nice um, tribute to my daughter, Amalia. Um, and let me just start by saying uh, it is fresh. Um, Amalia passed away just four months ago. So I'm still very much in the very early stages of grieving and figuring out what that process means for me and what it means for our family. Um, so if I start crying while I'm talking, please excuse my humanity. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background about our story. Uh, my husband and I, we um, conceived Amalia in 2011. She was born beautiful and healthy in 2012. Developed normally, just like uh, any other baby, um, hitting all those milestones. And around 18 months, we noticed that she was um, regressing in some of her skills and her motor skills were going away. Uh, she also started to lose um, her, some of her, her balance. She would, she would lose her balance quite easily. And, um, you know, my husband and I were very naive and we just thought, oh, she's, uh, um, we, I live in Germany, by the way. So we thought, oh, maybe she's just focusing on her language skills. She's learning German and English. And we were kind of naive until her daycare said, started to notice and um, be concerned as well. And they recommended that we go see a neurologist. Long story short is it took us down uh, a journey of a lot of specialists, a lot of doctors until we found out that she had a rare genetic disease. Um, and that diagnosis came to us uh, in May of 2015, she was just a little over three years old. And, um, you know, we call it D-Day, Diagnosis Day. Uh, and my husband and I, you know, I remember this day very clearly. We, after we left um, the doctors and took a long walk through the park and, I think it's part of just being in our DNA in general, but um, we made a commitment to ourselves that very day that we were going to take, we knew that the diagnosis, uh, her diagnosis is Tay-Sachs, um, gangliosidosis um, type two, and she had the juvenile form. There is no cure for this disease. Um, and uh, so going back, we, made a decision that we were going to live the best life that we could 
with her with the limited time that we knew at, from that day on that we were going to have and um and i and i think that this is it's it's a very difficult position to be put in as a parent or anybody who has to take care of someone and, and at that point she didn't require some of the um intensive care that she needed later on in her life but we agreed with each other that we were going to support each other in in making sure we were going to take care of ourselves because the only way to run that marathon which full-time caretaking is a marathon is to take care of ourselves first and um so that's a little bit of a background of our of of how we came to this conversation i'm happy to talk about more specifics in terms of um what did that what did that well-being mean for me? What did it mean for our family? Um, uh, yeah, I, I would love that because I think this is where um, uh, like really practical um, tools for people as they care, as they become caregivers. And, and I know so many people, this is what we face, right? We face this, this, you know, that, well, what we know in, in life is that you, you're not in charge <laughs> of what life brings you. You're in charge of what you do with what you are presented with, right? And so I guess the big thing I would ask you first is from a mindset perspective, mm -hmm. because I watched you take these, post these amazing memories. Like you really cherished the moments that you had with Amalia. And there was some like, so like fun and funny and, I mean, really, I felt like I got to go on this journey with you. And but how did you um, how did you keep your mindset when you felt yourself, you know, heading because it all will happen for all of us when you get yourself heading down a dark hole? Like, how did you what was your how did you do it? Well, a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, I treated my body really well. So um, was making sure that it was fueled with the right kinds of foods, um, making sure I was getting as much sleep as I could, which many times wasn't realistic. Uh, um, and I'll put it, I think if anybody's watching or anybody um, has, some, anybody watching who has a, um, a child who require, who has more medical complexity will know that, or, or, intensive needs it's like taking care of a newborn all the time for years so that's kind of what it, what, what <laughs> so when you need sleep taking the sleep when you can get it um uh putting in my calendar days that i would go to yoga that i would take a walk um i really relied on my friends when i was stuck at home in germany we have tough winters and there would be literally months from January to March where basically she couldn't leave the house because um, it was just either infect high infections or just simply too cold and uh, it was just too challenging for us. So I really relied on my community to come and just be around, bring over a coffee and not and asking for help and not being ashamed of asking for help, which oftentimes it is, um, especially for someone like me who, um, you know, Tracy and I met in a uh, work environment, financial services industry, it's very intense. Right. I would call her like we were power women. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so it's difficult to ask for uh, for help. And, and also we're getting all these messages as women that we're supposed to be the perfect mother and the perf perfect at our job and perfect wives. And, and we're supposed to actually, we can't show a sign of weakness. Right. I learned very early on, it's okay to ask for help. And in fact, I was pretty surprised at how much people did want to help. So if I think about that really, but this is good that we're having this conversation, Tracy, because it helps me actually really figure out what were the, what were those uh, pillars that, that kind of built the stability to, to take care of her. And uh, so nutrition, yeah. first and foremost, exercise second. Um, community, whether that's friends and family. Um, and lastly, doing things that I would say are um, maybe indulging, like having a date night with my husband, making sure that we did that, uh, having a nurse on a Saturday night once or twice a month so I could really just connect with him. 
um, I think those are, or even going, you know, going to see a movie or taking a night and going into a, to a hotel and sleeping in a hotel so I can sleep in. I mean, travel was definitely restricted the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so, and all of those things, really, I know people probably hear this all the time when you get in an airplane and they give you the safety speech and they say, put on your air mask first. <laughs> I mean, it was exactly like that. And, um, and also supporting my husband in, in that he could do that too. Because I think my husband needed to take care of me so I could take care of Amalia. And so it was kind of this, this, this um, trickle down effect. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I, so I, I love this because you just said so many things that I think are so important to people, not only in your situation, right? But when you're in, when you are in crisis mode, and that's what you, you lived in years of essentially crisis mode, like truly, like anything could happen at any time. You had to be like on the ready. Um, yeah, that's, right. yeah. taking, care, right. taking care of yourself is the most important thing. And I love what you said about, they say about social networks. And what's interesting is, you know, they say, going back to your like newborn conversation, that in other cultures, women are not left alone with their newborn baby. That is a very like new, newer kind of concept that you'd have a baby, you'd go home and you'd be by yourself with your baby. And, and I would say that it's probably true of also anyone in other, like in other cultures dealing with any kind of like family illness, like people, communities um, built around like taking care of each other. And in today's society, we often feel like we have to go off. And I think particularly with women feel like we have to go off and do it on our own. Absolutely. And, and that is a burden if we're asking somebody else to do it for us with, and, and, you know, to your point, like, you know, say you can't have, um, you know, you don't even have the resources to have a babysitter. A friend would come up, be happy to come over mm -hmm. and let you run to yoga. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, there's different ways, I think, to make sure that you, you take time for yourself. Right. And there then is I will say the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about is you, um, your mind, you just have a positive mindset. And so like, how did you, so I, I guess we could kind of close on you just sharing this, like, how did you keep yourself um, focused on the joy? And then how do you see, what, what do you want to do for like now to help people who are dealing with anything that's kind of similar? So to answer the first part of that question, um, mindset, Ooh, uh, I think this is actually, pro you could probably do a whole series on mindset. Um, so one, as I said earlier, I do think it's just intrinsic in my DNA. It's just my core, my core essence is really joy and leading with joy. So I think I have that already in my corner, <laughs> you know, thank, thanks to my mom and dad and their genetics <laughs> and the way that they raised me. Um, but secondarily is, I think that that focus of prioritizing those first two key, well, all of those pillars, but the first two of just making sure that I'm taking care or taking care of myself um, automatically puts you in a better mindset. I mean, the two are correlated. Um, I think all of us can say, I know if I, you know, if I have a, a fun girl, you know, girls night out and I drink a little bit too much and then, you know, I'm 46, I definitely cannot do what I did when I was 26 now, and, you know, feel, feel the same way, but um, we all know how you feel, but if you are required to constantly be on your game, be able to take care of someone, be able to respond to situations, which did happen a lot of times where you're responding to emergencies, you just all you, at the end of the day, you need to take make a choice. Do I want to feel good so I can take care of my child, or do I want to feel like shit? Excuse my language, and and not be as present and taking advantage as as much of it as I can. But also, um, mindset. I'm really inspired by um, um, yogic philosophy um, and um, also some modern philosophers. Um, and I think through the experience of watching and guiding through someone, this is where it gets emotional. Um, you know, I, I had the privilege of, of guiding my child into this life, but I also had this beautiful experience to guide her out of this life. And 
not very many parents have that. So um, when, when I flip that switch to say, I can look at this from a different perspective. I can look at this as a challenge and that I'm a victim, or I can say, I have an opportunity to, to create the most beautiful and magical life for my child who is dying and I can guide her through that. And I may, I have the choice. And, and, and I think probably in my spiritual beliefs that it came very much from the heart that I learned that I had the control of this um, and to use all of those other tools to support that process. And I will say in the end, um, you know, my husband and I absolutely achieved uh, what our wish was for her in, at, at, in the end of life. Um, she died very peacefully without any pain with the two of us at home. And she didn't see a day in the hospital um, in an emergency situation. And that was something that we did everything that we possibly could to avoid. And we, we were successful in that. Um, so, and the second part of that question, to answer the, the second part of the question, um, so I, I did start a, a charity organization here in Germany in Munich uh, to support other families who have a, a child in palliative care um, to focus on how, how, to, how to support them in their journeys of care, caretaking and helping them build some tools and resources both for themselves and also access to other, other families to create a community um, to help e where we can help each other um, and also learning new habits about saying, taking help, <laughs> being able to ask for help um, and also helping them establish some, some of their own personal well-being goals through diet and exercise and, and other, um, what, I, what I call total well-being but that's, that's uh, probably in those four pillars again. And <laughs> so that's how I hope to honor her legacy and um, move forward on my own journey now, yeah. which, which seems scary, but exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I um, so I, I'm sure with, for all of you guys who are listening and listen to this later, you'll You'll know why I love Carrie so much because she's amazing. Um, and we are, as you imagine, um, because we are seeing eye to eye on so many things. And I, um, and I think this is just like, no matter where you are in, in your life and what your situation is, these are universal truths. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I can't wait for you to hear more from Carrie. I want Carrie, I want to thank you so much for doing mm -hmm. this with me. I love you so much. Uh, we're going to sign off, but this was amazing. And you're, you are amazing. Thank okay. you. Bye everybody. Bye.